I'm glad to be here. Chuck is taking, he took his mother's stuff to Arizona, he and Mandy, and uh, she has moved down there to be with his sister. Um, and they're heading back, so that's, that's a trip you want to make, driving a truck all the way to Arizona and back. But that's where they're at, uh, hopefully back soon, and uh, want to pray for them. So I want to tell you up front that there's a reason why this message, why this passage is on my heart. There's, when I preach, you know, Dan probably could tell you too, um, it's easier for me, because I only preach every now and then, for God to use the things he's been teaching me to build a sermon around. And, and the truth is, this is where I am, okay? So when we get to the application part, this is for me. I hope it's for you. I think it probably is for you. Uh, but I want to work through this together because I, I'm living here where Peter is talking about. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. So if you have your Bible or the Pew Bible or your smartphone or whatever you use to look up God's Word, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. Just the first nine verses of that little chapter, and we're going to talk about that. And... All of these things in the slide behind me are what it's about. Doubt, delay, diligence. And they all kind of sweep together as Peter is addressing issues in the churches he's writing to. And he's trying to get them to respond appropriately to the pressure that they're feeling. So we'll talk about that in a second. But I think it would be best if we pray and ask God to help us through this. Father, thank you for leading me to this place. Thank you for shaking me to wake me in an area that needed to be done. And I pray that I would continue to respond as I should to your leading. And I thank you now for leading me to this passage. I thank you for these folks who are in front of me. I thank you for the opportunity to have, that I have to share your word with them. I pray now for your Holy Spirit to fill me, to talk through me, to use my words and impress upon the hearts of these folks what it is you want to teach them. Use your word as it is presented to make the changes in us that need to be made. Give us courage to follow through on your leading today. Lord, we pray for our pastor, for Mandy, as they travel back. I pray for safety for them. I know it's not only a long, difficult journey, but I know at the end his sister is there and his mother is there and the emotions and all of the decisions and all of that. I just pray for wisdom and grace for his family as they go through a difficult time with many, many more difficult times ahead. But I pray that your strength would be evident and your presence would be known to them and their family. Father, meet with us now. I ask that everything that is done here, has been done, will be to your honor and to your glory, for you alone deserve it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pressure. Pressure. Everybody knows pressure. Everybody understands stress. If you look at pressure in a thesaurus, you get these kinds of words, none of which seem all that positive. Pressure can be a good thing, right? Certain types of pressure are okay. But for the most of us, we, we think about some of these hard words like adversity and burden and constraint and strain and tension and pressure, and we all feel it, right? We all know it. We all live under a certain amount of stress difficult times that we face and it goes up and it goes down but it, it's not unknown to us to live under stress and you have all experienced stress <clears throat> and you probably experienced some of the symptoms of stress your cognitive abilities can be affected by stress and by pressure in your life your memory fades I'm not saying that's what happened to Roger here but who knows right <laughs> You, you can't concentrate like you'd like because of the pressures around you from, what, from whatever source they're coming, whether internal or external. Poor judgment sometimes is, is evidence when we're under stress. You can get some emotional responses that aren't necessarily positive in your life either, right? Anxiety or, or moodiness or these feelings of isolation because of the stress you feel around you, the pressure and we all know, you've all gone to the doctor, right? And they will tell you some of the physical ailments that they treat are a result of stress or pressure in a person's life. Chest pains, stomach aches, right? Physical manifestations of the pressure that we feel. There are also some behavioral issues that we can face. 
We withdraw from others. We may procrastinate about things we know we should do, but we just don't feel like it because of the pressure around us. And that's just from the world's point of view of what stress can do in an individual's life. We know as Christians, people sitting in this room, people who populate churches all over the world today, that there can be spiritual manifestations of stress. And we're going to talk about some of those today because Peter's writing to a group of people, whether you know it or not, I'm going to give you a quick background on Peter. Peter is probably in Rome at this time. He's probably writing this little book of 2 Peter very near the end of his life. His life ended in probably 80, 68, okay, when Nero uh, crucified him, executed him. But he's writing to this group of churches, all right? You see here a little picture of, of Asia Minor, right? These are churches, <clears throat> these are cities that had churches that were probably established when Paul started his missionary journeys, probably not more than 20 years ago. 20 years. And they're under stress. Understand that Christians are not the dominant religion in this area. They're by far the minority. And in fact, they're in opposition to the official state religion, which is to worship Caesar. So they're not only not recognized as an official religion, they're also ostracized and they're persecuted for their faith because they're not following the law. They are feeling pressure from Rome. They're feeling pressure from their families because most of these came out of Jewish backgrounds as once they turned from being a, a, a good synagogue going Jew and turned to Christianity to follow this Jesus person, followers of the way, they were probably ostracized by their family. So they felt family pressure, they felt uh, financial pressure as they were cut off from their families. They were small minorities and they were huddled together and the pressure is ramping up. It's not easy to be a Christian and Peter understands that. And certain amount of back and forth happens, certain, you know, people travel and missionaries go through and evangelists and people are going back and forth and he gets word that they're struggling in their faith. And he's going to address a specific issue that is, comes up in 2 Peter 3 that we're going to talk about. And he wants to know how they're going to respond. And he's going to tell them what he thinks is best. So he's going to give them a little stimulation, right? A little stimulation, a little thing to get them going. And he starts with these two verses. Dear friends, I got, I got to get it so I can read it, right? On this little screen, it's too small. So you bear with me while I get there, right? Kind of new at this whole PowerPoint thing. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Hence, we call it Second Peter, right? I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Now, that sounds all very pedantic and very pedagogic, okay? I get it. But how do you think that was said? I have highlighted two, set, two phrases or two verbs for you, to stimulate and to recall. Now, I grew up in a family. My mother is not a loud, demonstrative person, but she did have different ways of using my name, right? Probably for you too, right? You knew when you got called what the tone meant, right? Right? You guys are all going, yep, I remember, right? Ryan, simple. If I got Ryan Richard... Now I knew there was more to be had to the rest of the story. But the way that we say things, we can pull out the emotion of what's behind it. Be I now live with Bev. been living with Bev for 35 years. I know when my name gets called, where I stand. Okay? Usually I hide in the basement. That's what I do. But I know when she says it and how she says it, the emotion behind it, what I may be facing when I ask her, Yes, dear? Right? And you know what I'm talking about. So what we try to do when we're looking at these passages, we try to see if this Greek word, these are, you know, this is translated to, to English for us. We look at other words that maybe the writer used in different contexts to see maybe we can get a better understanding. Paul wrote a lot of books so we can look, you know, what does grace mean? And we look at grace in all these different books and we get a pretty good picture of what it means. Well, Peter doesn't use this word but once. Right? But I want you to think about a story, okay? Step back in Peter's life, okay? And I want you to think about the story when Jesus was tired 
And he wanted to get her across the Sea of Galilee. And instead of walking around, which would have been much more difficult and taken a long time, he asked his fellows to put him in a boat and row across. Remember that story? And halfway across or partway across, and certainly not close enough to get right back to shore, a storm comes up. Remember that story? Okay. I'll help you. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out, and they sailed. He, Jesus, fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, we're going to drown. Now, I just said it in a very matter-of-fact way, right? How do you think that went? I'm pretty sure Peter was the first one to Jesus, right? Fair? Uh, Jesus. Jesus, hey, wake up, Jesus. How about, hey, you do realize there's water coming in the boat and we are going to drown. Will you please wake up? Now, you all have teenagers at some point in time and you have to yell at them to wake up, right? Sometimes, okay? How much emotion is in the disciples' voice when they go to Jesus and say, wake up? Yeah, don't you realize we are going to drown and you included? Right? And that story always reminds me of Toy Story. This is how my mind works. Okay? Buzz and Woody are under the car, and Buzz Lightyear says, Now, Sheriff, this is no time to panic. And what does Woody say? It's a perfect time to panic! Right? And don't you think that's how Peter is? We are going to drown, and you are sleeping! So there's some import to this. There's some emotion. And the funny thing is, when he says, Wake up! It's the same word that Peter uses when he says, I'm trying to stimulate you. I'm trying to wake you up. The stress has caused lethargy and paralysis in you, and I'm trying to stimulate your mind. So wake up. There's some emotion behind this word. There's some import to him. There's some urgency. More than that, there's another word, right? Right? Dear friends, this is how my second letter to you, right? Reminders. I want you to recall the words. Okay? Recall the words. One other Peter story. Okay? One other Peter story. Near the end of Jesus' life, he tried to explain to the disciples many times that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to die. They didn't want to believe it. They didn't believe it. They struggled with that. It was a concept they couldn't get their heads around. It didn't make any sense. And it probably wouldn't to you and me if we were in their shoes. Okay? Now here comes Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And now he tells us he's going to go die. That doesn't make any sense. None of that makes sense to them. <clears throat> so Peter, because he's impetuous and he's right up front, and God bless him for that. He gets a lot of bad press for being a loud mouth guy. But man, he's right there with some emotion. He's got some passion about this. And he says, Lord, you know, even if you're going to die, we're going to Jerusalem, we'll die with you. And gives that whole speech. And Jesus says to him, okay, Peter, I, I appreciate that. But let me tell you a little story. Peter replied, even if, I, if all fall away on account of you, I never will. <sighs> Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know the man. You know, the three times, you know, somebody, a little, little girl at the fire. Hey, do you know that Jesus? No, I don't know that Jesus. But he gets down the third time and he's frustrated and he's swearing. And he says, I don't know that guy. And I don't know what language he used. And I'm glad they don't write it down. But he swears he has nothing to do with this Jesus person. Leave me alone. I don't know the man. Two verses earlier, he said, I'll die for you, right? Immediately, the rooster crowed, and I highlight it in yellow. Peter remembered. Now, I highlight it for a reason. You've already figured it out. It's the same word that Peter uses when he says, I want you to recall. I want you to remember. I want you to remember so that it makes an impact in your life. And Peter's life changed dramatically forever when the rooster crowed. I have no doubt, it's just me, 
But I'm guessing that for the rest of Peter's life, every time he heard a rooster crow, he remembered. He remembered. And he's asking these people, he said, I want you to remember. I want you to remember like I remember. I want you to look back at what you've been taught and remember and have it make an impact. When I remembered what Jesus told me, it changed my life. I want what Jesus told you to change your life. And he mentions, I want you to look back and think about all the things the prophets you learned about as a good Jewish kid growing up. I want you to think about all what the prophets said for hundreds of years and think about what Jesus said and his apostles said. And I want you to recall that stuff. You don't need any new information here. You don't need new revelation from me. You don't need more stuff. You don't need any more bullets for your apologetic gun. You need to remember what you already know. And stir up your mind. There is a mental component to your faith. Christians get abused all the time for being blindly going down a road and living on faith with, and disengaging their minds. And it's for not, it couldn't be further from the truth from the New Testament. Okay? It's engaging what you know into your life. That's called faith, right? What do you know? What do you know the prophets taught? What do you know Jesus taught? What do you know his apostles have taught you since then? Put that into practice. Put it, get it out of the doldrums. Pull it out of the drawers of your mind and put it back in front of you and think about it. Stir your mind up. Get that mental capacity going again. Okay? When we're under stress and under pressure, we forget a whole lot of stuff. Things that are important to us don't become important anymore and people are frustrated with us because, well, why don't you see that as important anymore? It's just kind of faded in the background because of the pressure. That's a natural response. And Peter says, don't let that happen to you. Stir it up. Get it back in there. Get it back in your mind. Engage your mind because your mind isn't going to engage your will and then your will can engage your feet or your hands or your lips or whatever to accomplish something. So what was the pressure coming from? Well, the scoffers. That was a good word. We don't use scoffing much anymore. You scoffer. That's not exactly something we call people, is it? But the word here is mocking. These are people who are making fun of these believers for what they're saying, for what they believe. Now, I don't know how much scoffing or mocking you have endured in your life because you are a Christian, because of what you believe, all right? Maybe a lot, maybe a little, maybe never. I don't know, but these people felt it. And now the pressure's not just coming from outside bad people, outside the church. Some of these people know what they're talking about. Some of these are their Jewish friends. Some of these are Jewish family. Some of these people come from a background where they know almost as much as they do, right? And they're mocking them. They're making fun of them. And they just don't see it. And above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers or mockers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it's since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, God's word, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water, by these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now that's a long kind of tumbling phrase. I get that. But here are the mockers. And Peter has just told them to get your mind in gear. Think about what you know. Think about, line up the facts that you know, okay? You can trust what Jesus said. You can trust what the apostles told you because Jesus told the apostles what to say. Those are facts. You got them in your repository of your mind. What are these people doing? They're looking around and they see no evidence of Jesus returning. I just heard the funniest story about a pro football player. I listen to a lot of talk radio and sports talk radio. There's a, there's a guy, some professional football player now, and it's training camp, and they get all kinds of goofy quotes. And he says, I don't believe in no dinosaurs because I ain't never seen a T-Rex. Okay, well, <laughs> in your limited experience of being 24 years old, and he's never seen a T-Rex, he says, there never ain't been no dinosaurs. No, ain't no man ever saw one. Now, that's, that was a quote. I did pretty well there, didn't I? Right? Ain't no man ever saw one. Well, he believes archaeologists went around planted all the bones underneath the dirt. I'm like, wow, he just keeps going with his story because he hasn't seen any evidence of a T-Rex. He doesn't believe they exist. Okay? Now, the mockers and the scoffers say, look, Jesus says he's going to return. He hasn't returned. Guess it's not happening. 
Now understand, this has been at most 40 years. Most of you can think back 40 years, right? Okay, 40 years since Jesus' resurrection, <clears throat> excuse me, resurrection and ascension into heaven, and he hasn't returned. 40 years, I don't see any evidence of that. Nope, been 40 years, hasn't come back yet, I guess he's not coming, right? So they don't see the evidence, that, and they, all they see are empty promises. They don't see any of this stuff. They're going, ah, man, they've been talking about this since the beginning of time. All them old Jewish guys, Enoch, Moses, all those prophets all the way through to Malachi have been talking about Jesus, the Messiah, coming. They didn't see the first coming. They don't see a second coming. From their perspective, they see nothing. And because they don't see anything, they think you're stupid for believing it. And they're making fun of you. And now the pressure is mounting because now what's happening? You're starting to go, well, maybe they're right. Right? We're going to talk about seeds of doubt in a minute. What they don't see, they see what they think they see, but they're not seeing it, right? They're not seeing the forest for the trees. Okay? I don't know if you can read that or not. I'll read it to you. I got this from Chuck Swindoll because he's smarter than me. These facts from biblical prophecy about Christ's return may surprise you. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions the subject of Christ's return or the end of time. Of the 216 chapters in the New Testament, there are well over 300 references to the return of Christ. 23 out of 27 of the, of the New Testament books mention Christ's return. In the Old Testament, such well-known and reliable men of God, such as Job, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel, as well as most of the minor prophets, mention Christ's return in their writings. And Christ often spoke specifically about his own return to earth. Now, if there's one thing I know about theology, I know a few things, but one thing I do know and will tell you to the day I die is Jesus is coming again. He is coming back. I know he's coming back because he said he's coming back. Fair? And the scoffers and the mockers couldn't see it because from their limited perspective, they didn't see any evidence of that, so they didn't believe it exists. But Peter saying, look, look at the mountain of evidence. When you look back at all those holy prophets I talked to you about and about Jesus and about what we've been telling you, Jesus is coming back. But because they've been listening and falling back from the pressure of the scoffers and the mockers, what's happening are things that we can all relate to. They have planted seeds of doubt. Doubt. You start to question, don't you? You start to wonder if they're correct. Maybe we're, we got it wrong. Maybe we don't know what we think we know. Maybe we've been sold a bill of goods, right? And Peter says, not only recall that stuff, but look at how this all hooks together. When the earth was formed without form and void in Genesis 1-2, it was just a big muddy mass of all the atoms and stuff that God had created, right? And it took a while, a couple of days, right, for God to separate the waters from the water so that dry land appeared, okay? That water, watery mass, also was what happens, what? At the flood, the waters of the flood, that deluged the earth and judged sin, you know, and the boat, Noah, right, and his kids. And then he connects that with not only that period of time, but the end of time. So time as we measure it, because we wouldn't be able to measure it without a sun, moon, and stars, right? We wouldn't know how many days have passed if there's no light in the sky. So from the beginning of creation, when God created this concept called time, and he lives outside of it, right, until he calls an end to it, it's all interconnected. It's hooked together. There's not only a preponderance of evidence, there's consistency in the evidence. So don't let the scoffers tell you how stupid you are when they're not even recognizing the facts of the truth, the true facts of the story. But because you've been listening to them, now you're beginning to doubt. You're starting to doubt yourself. You're starting to doubt who you are, you're starting to doubt the veracity of the testimony of the people who told it to you. So I'm going to have to give you a little motivation. Right? Doubt is that feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. Right? Been there in your faith? Okay? If you've been a Christian long enough, you've doubted your faith at some point in time. You may have doubted the existence of God. I like what Brian McLaren said. Brian McLaren is one of my favorite authors. And he said, and he's in a church there. Most of the people, he was in a church, you know, just 
does famous things like speak in conferences and stuff. But when he was in a church and he had most of our new Christians, and this lady he knew had been a Christian for a little while, came up to him and said, would you please pray for me? I'm in, that one, I'm in one of those periods of time where I doubt if God exists. And he thought, what an irony. Here's a lady struggling with her faith about whether God exists is asking me to pray to the one that she's doubting if they exist. Right? And we chuckle a little bit about that, but we get it, right? We've been there. We all have been there. We've had that doubt about whether we're doing the right thing, if it's even worth it, if God exists, and maybe you've had those. And don't, do not beat yourself up for having doubts. It's okay. The question is, what do you do with those? Are you going to allow those doubts to cause paralysis in your life or lethargy or you just kind of fall back and you, you become a non-helpful, a non-serving, a non-worshipping kind of Christian where you're just alone? but you're not effective in your ministry. Doubt is kind of like pain, right? You have a pain, you go to the doctor, you fix it, and you're done, right? Okay? It tells us that something is around us or in us that's dangerous and calls for our attention. If we have doubts, we're going to have to address those. And that's what Peter says. You have doubts about your faith, go back to what you know. Go back to the truth. The truth's going to set you free. Don't listen to these guys. Now, the dark side of doubt, and I meet these people in, in our jail ministry, and, and Mr. Potter will tell you, okay? Doubts keep around and pile up on your head and in your heart and your mind. The dark side of doubt is despair and depression. And out of control, it leads to unbelief or a hardness of heart or an arrogance, right? And you're starting to see that now because atheism, it's popular to be an atheist. And it's okay to bash Christians now. It's okay to tell them how stupid they are for believing these myths and these fables. If we let that happen, we too can end up in a place with a hard heart and a place of unbelief. And in this place, these people became scoffers and mockers and they made fun of these people and they, and they called them stupid, I'm sure, for even believing such a thing. So what's Peter say? All right. <clears throat> Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. If you're going to remember one thing and only one thing, remember this. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You have to look past the doubters. Okay? If there's a loud mouth atheist, and there are plenty, okay, and they rail at you for how dumb you are and how foolish you are for believing the thing, you've got to look past that because they're not the source of all truth. You've got to go to what you know. You've got to go to the truth. You've got to go to God's word and say, okay, what has been standing now for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? What has been the truth for this long and what has impacted my life in the past? You've got to look past the shouting of the doubters and the scoffers and the mockers. And you've got to look past the circumstances. Look, I've been alive for 56 years. Jesus hasn't come back yet. But I'm not foolish enough to think that God is bound by a 56-year span of time. You got to look past your circumstances. We get into times of doubt when circumstances usually are not so good. But the circumstances do not define you. The circumstances do not define who you are in God's economy, the way he sees you has nothing to do with your circumstances of your job or your relationships or any of that stuff. You got to look past the circumstances. These people are under pressure. They're living in a place. We live in America and we're God blessed to be so that we, for a long time, Christians have been in the majority and we have had religious freedom. We don't know a thing really about persecution. We don't. There are brothers and sisters around the world that have been living under persecution since the day they came to Christ. They're dying for their faith all over the world. We don't know anything about that, so we don't really have a frame of reference. We like to think we do, but we don't. And these people were under pressure. Peter was very close to being executed for being who he was, and he knew it. Okay? So look past your circumstances. And look past the time lag. 
We just talked about this in our Sunday school class last week. Really? 40 years since Jesus has returned? How long has the world been around? Don't get into that argument. Okay, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want you to argue whether it's millions of years old or 6,000 years. It doesn't matter. But to God, he's outside of time. So your 40-year window, all right, do the math. If a day's like 1,000 years, right, and 24 hours in a day, that's roughly 40 hours, okay, 40 years per hour. Right? That'd be 960. Let me help you with the math. <clears throat> In other words, you, Jesus has been gone for 40 years, and that to God is like an hour. Now, if you were waiting for someone, yesterday I had to wait for my cousin to come to the restaurant, took my mom to the airport, drove her through a, hur a hurricane, through a tornado. I'm going to South Carolina this week, so I'm going to go to hurricane season. But anyway, to, to get her to the airport, so I had to wait for my cousin to come and have dinner. And he was late. Now, if he was an hour late, what would I say? Well, I guess he's an hour late. Oh, he's never coming. <laughs> oh, man. Right? One hour, we wouldn't think anything about it. And Peter said, look, your time frame is so warped. When you're thinking 40 years is all there is, you don't have God's perspective on the time lag. So look past the time lag. But more than that, and this is where the conviction came in for me, you have to see this delay as an opportunity. As an opportunity. Now, some of you know I do jail ministry. And for a while, I had struggles. I didn't have struggles. My mother had struggles physically, and I went to a whole lot of doctor's appointments, and things came up, and I have a new business, and lots of things came. And it just didn't work out to go on Mondays and Tuesdays to the jail. And I went for a long time where I didn't go. And then I started to find myself seeing that it was convenient to use those as excuses not to carve out the time to go to the jail to do ministry there. And finally, I'm reading this passage, and God shakes me, stirs me up, stimulates me, shakes me to wake me for me to understand that these are opportunities I am letting slip by. Every morning or afternoon, depending on when I can fit it in, I can go to the jail to tell people about Jesus is another day those guys have to hear the gospel. Now, there is nothing wrong with loving the appearing of Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong for asking God to come back soon. The apostles did it, right? They loved his appearing. Paul says there's a crown for those who love his appearing, and I'm all for Jesus coming and taking me home. But if he chooses not to, I got to do something. And Peter's trying to impress upon them, look, God's waiting for a reason because he's patient. He wants people to come to repent. He's given them yet another day to repent. Now, you probably have people in your life, maybe in your family, that you've been praying about. Some of you have been praying about some people in your family for years to come to Christ. And every day the sun comes up is another day they have an opportunity. And I'm reading this passage and God is saying, you have got to do what I have called you to do to take advantage of the opportunities I'm giving you. I'm giving you days. I'm giving you chances. I'm giving you chances to take the gospel and share it with people who aren't otherwise going to hear it. People who are in their mess. Right? Remember Chuck talked about that? Go into the mess. You go to the jail, you're in the mess, man. I'm telling you. There's a messy, yucky lives there. But they need the gospel. And God was impressing on me that I am giving you opportunities. I'm waiting to come back because you got stuff to do. There's a convicting little book called They Like Jesus But They Don't Like the Church by Dan Kimball. And it's very sobering and it's very enlightening as he shares his experience with people who have either been in church, they have whatever, it doesn't matter. But they're very honest with them about how they feel about the church and they, they give you all the standard answers of what's wrong with church and, and all of that, okay? And I was reading it again because I'd lost some of this. I'm gonna confess to you, I've lost some of this. It's easier not to take my faith out and share it. It is. 
Okay? I can find plenty of places to go to spend my time, plenty of people I can talk to that I know like me and think like me. I can have breakfast with Dan and we can, you know, we can chat about stuff and he's not going to chastise me for stuff. We're just going to talk and we're going to agree that church is important and what can we do to enhance ministry. We can do that. I could go out to lunch with Roger and be the same way. And I'd lost some of this. Am I numb or neutral? Just don't care to people outside my church. The church. Not First Baptist Church. The church. Church with a big C. Church with Jesus Christ. Do I pray daily for people outside the church who don't know Jesus and need to know? Who am I praying for now? Who's not a Christian? Who's on my list? And I used to have a list when I did jail ministry on a regular basis. I'd write down their names and I would pray for those men. And I'd go back and I'd see them and we'd talk some more. And I realized my book had some missing entries for a long time. And I went back Monday and I started to fill my book up again. And I started to pray again for Anthony and for others. When was the last time I had coffee or dinner or just hung out with someone who's not a Christian? Just to build a relationship, just to start the conversation, just to steer it in a direction that it needs to go, not for my benefit so I can feel better that I did the right thing, but for their benefit because their soul is in the balance. And as Peter stimulated him, and motivated them and encouraged these people in their faith. And he couldn't get to them because he was incarcerated. He was never going to see them face to face again if he had ever seen them before. But they knew who he was. And he's trying as he can to write this tiny little letter. And it's going to get passed around all these churches. And he's hoping that God has inspired it, which he has. And that it will make a difference in these people's life. And it will motivate them and encourage them at a time when they're under duress. They're under stress. They're having doubts about their faith. And it's, and it's showing up in their lack of response to people outside. Understand that there's still that mental component and I'm telling you to have some answers about what you believe. Know what you believe, why you believe it. I'm not telling you you have to be the greatest, great, world's greatest apologist. That's not the point. But what do you believe? What do you know? What do you know to be the truth that you can hang on to? And get excited about being a missionary. Ooh, that's a scary word, right? Every missionary when I was a kid would come on Wednesday, one Wednesday night a month. They'd come, they'd bring slides. Every missionary was in Africa. I don't know why that was. And I was sure if you got to be a missionary, you were going to be a missionary in Africa, right? And they'd come with pictures of animals, and Dr. Long would bring pictures of like 18-pound goiters. And you're like, ah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a missionary. I don't want to go there, right? Please don't send me to Africa. That's not it at all. You have a mission, a commission given by Jesus Christ. We are missionaries, whether you like the word or not, whether it scares you or not. You have a mission field. You're placed in a place. You have influence over people I will never, ever know. You're a missionary. And get excited about that. Look, people, don't let it push you back into yourself and isolate yourself. Look at what you got, what you know, what you got to share. Be excited about being a missionary. But understand this, we will never, ever, as a church, as individuals, ever have it all together. We won't. We don't get everything right here. Come on. You'd be foolish to think. We try really, really hard, but we'll never, ever get it all right. We'll never, ever have it all together. But that's okay. We'll never have it all together, but we can still have a missional heart. So I sang about Brian uh, Baker prayed with me this morning about having a missional heart. What is our mission here? What are we doing here? Not only as a church, but as individuals. And I was convicted because I had lost my missional heart. I'd lost it. It was still there. It was dormant. And it needed to be stimulated. It needed to be shocked back into working and beating again. To get excited about the fact that the gospel can change people's lives. And I can share it. I get to be that. Now maybe you're not wired like me. I understand that. But you still have something to share. You still have a life to share. You still have a story to tell. 
Your story is the most powerful thing you can tell about what God has done for you. You know, Chuck has a key thought, right? He's really good at this stuff. Here's my key thought. People who need Jesus need you. People who need Jesus need you. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Jesus isn't here yet. He's left us to share the good news with other people. He's not here. His Holy Spirit's inside you as a Christian, driving you forward, energizing you, giving you all the resources, but he's not here. But they desperately need to know him. How is your heart beating today? Is it beating for people who don't know Jesus? But you do. I'm not railing on you. I've already, I've already beat myself up over this. You've you got to let the Holy Spirit do that. But is your heart beating for people who don't know Jesus? But you do. Can you be that cup of cold water? Can you be that kind word? Can you be that act of service that opens the door for a conversation? Can you love people for just who they are and look past all the other stuff they come with? Can you look past their mess and see a heart that needs Jesus? I lost it. Somewhere along the line, somewhere in the busyness of my life, somewhere in the concern over my mom, somewhere in there, all well-meaning good things, I kind of lost it somewhere. But because of the grace of God and his Holy Spirit leading me through his word to places that I needed to go, I think he shocked it back into place, into rhythm. And you need that every now and then because it's going to happen. But understand that if Peter was here and he looked at you and he could evaluate who were, where you were, he would tell you the same thing. He knew Jesus. He knew people who needed Jesus. He knew he had to take that gospel. It motivated him. And he wants it to motivate you. It's my story. I don't know where your story goes. I trust it's motivational for you. If you've had doubts, go back to what you know. Work through it. Get your mind back into it. Figure it out. That's okay. If you've been pushed back by people and you've isolated yourself because you don't like the pain or the confrontation or the conflict, you're going to have to fight your way out of the corner in that. You're going to have to. You're going to have to stand up for yourself. Not because you're standing up for yourself, but because you're standing up for Jesus. As he told you, they won't hate, they hate me. But because I'm not here, they're going to hate you in return. Understand that's the way the game's played. Understand that's the rules of engagement. It's all part of the deal. So stand up and fight for yourself. It's okay. And it's okay to admit you were down on the mat. <laughs> it's okay to admit you got knocked down. But it's not okay to stay down. Let's pray. Father, I know that people around me need you. They need a... Oh, man, they need you. All those guys in jail that Dick and I see every week. Man, there's no hope for those guys without you. People never be able to muster up the resources in and of themselves to solve their deepest needs, to solve their biggest problem. I pray for your Holy Spirit to energize us to shock us back to where we need to be, to stimulate us, to motivate us, to encourage us, to push us along. To be carriers of the gospel to a world that needs to hear. Lord, thank you for working in my life. Thank you for working in my heart. I pray that we would be a church whose heart is missional, 
a church who sees themselves as missionaries in Charlotte and Eaton County. A church that longs to see people know you. Lord, may we be that kind of church. The church that honors you. Lord, I pray as we sing and close that your Holy Spirit would continue to teach us and lead us in the direction we need to go. Give us courage to respond as we should. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Roger. Well, there you go. That song kind of sums it up. Gives you all the resources you need to do what you have to do, as well as me. Okay? Understand, I preached a sermon all to myself. How cool was that? And you got to listen. Uh, but I appreciate you being here. Uh, continue to pray for Chuck and Mandy and, uh, and, and actually for all of our ministries because they really get ramped up here come school time, which is right around the corner. And uh, people are getting busy doing all that stuff to, to do what it is we're called to do here in Charlotte to minister to people in this community and around. So thank you so much for being here. Let's close with prayer and uh, you head off to Sunday school. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the impact it should and can make in our lives. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be the after teacher to this message to motivate us, to stimulate us, to encourage us to do what it is you've called us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.